That's the <laughs> nicest introduction I've ever had. I, can, we, can we record that and play it, play it every morning? I am here today with the world's most likable man. This is Nicky Gumbel. He has done a million things and he's a man with an incredible legacy. He developed the Alpha Course, which has influenced, I think, is it 30 million lives? I believe that's right, with an app that's also used by two million people. He was the pastor of Holy Trinity Brompton, which he led for 46 years alongside of his lovely wife, Pippa. And I can't believe he let me come to his home so I can be nosy and look through all his stuff. Nikki, oh, okay. thank you that's, for letting me do this. That's the nicest introduction I've ever had. <laughs> I, can we can we record that and play it, play it every morning? <laughs> well, <laughs> I feel like cheer stalked up. you because you've been a huge part of my spiritual growing up. Your course, the Alpha Course, was such a big deal in Canada. And I think, honestly, it's one of the only reasons my parents had friendships in their 40s. <laughs> it's because they had reasons to invite people over and work through a curriculum that you developed. Oh, so. well, I didn't know that, Kate. That is absolutely amazing. <laughs> But it is funny because it was all, it's, I'm so used to your face, but on VHS, where we just like <laughs> put in tape after tape, which I can't wait to tell you about. But before you were um, the man that all Canadians watched in church basements, <laughs> you were a very reluctant convert to Christianity, yes. weren't you? Yeah. So um, my father was a refugee. He was from, uh, fled the Nazis um, and um, he's Jewish. My mother took me for a walk when my I was 14, my sister's 18 months older, and she said to us, your father is German and Jewish, and you are never to speak to him about it. And I never did. I, I knew absolutely nothing about my father. He was 49 when he got married, 52 when I was born, and he only ever spoke about anything that had happened to him after he got married. So he would not, I had no idea where he went to school, university, anything he did. But yeah. a few years ago, I was contacted by the Judaica Museum in Berlin. And they said, uh, what do you know about your father? I said, I know absolutely nothing. What do you know? And they, and they sent me a file. Um, and they sent me my family tree. Oh my um, gosh. And I discovered my great grandfather was Moses. My, <laughs> My, my great great grandfather was Abraham, oh, good. Not, not the Abraham, but and I discovered, but I discovered also the concentration camps in which they died, and I realised why, um, why my father couldn't talk. Um, I think he was traumatised. I mean, I think you, now we'd say he was suffering from po post traumatic stress. It's an interesting thing that there, there there are lots of books that have been written about Christians who resisted Hitler, Bonhoeffer, and so on. I think now there's much more interest in Jews who resisted Hitler. And so that's what, you know, there's a book about my father's first cousin, Emil Gumbel, who was one of the, um, uh, he, was, he was thrown out of his university um, uh, in very early, uh, you know, in the early 1930s um, because he was Jewish. Mm. And there's, the book starts with Einstein's speech to a thousand students who'd gathered and Einstein saying why Professor Gumbel should not be thrown out of the university. Oh um, my gosh. And then Einstein got him out to, um, to where he became a professor in France and then he got him. And then eventually um, when Hitler invaded France, he stayed 40, 24 hours ahead of him. And then he got to Germany. I got to, Einstein got him to America. Wow. Um, so it's, it's a, I, I'm really fascinated now, as you can see by my family yeah. um, and seeing just trying to discover why my father was like he was. I found his war records. Uh -huh. He joined the British Army as a private in 1942, yeah. full colonel in 1945. What did he do? Yeah. You know, what, all I know is now I've discovered he interrogated Nazi uh, war criminals. But you know, I, just, I would just love one hour with my dad to say where he could talk. Yeah. You know, just come and tell me, yeah. what was it like? Um, you know, tell me what... And you know, now I've found photograph albums of him before and seeing a life that, that I never, never, you know, never knew about yes. him. To, to, to have someone that you love so much be an outline of, you know, they're only an outline yes. of what you think you yeah. know. And then you want yeah. to know the wholeness I, of yeah, them. I want to know so much. I have such respect for him yeah. and everything he said and, and told me. 
um, although he had so few words. Mm. Um, but uh, he was a man of absolute integrity. Somebody, my, his brother-in-law uh, said to us when we were two, I was about, I don't know, I was just a child. He said, um, you know, you realize your father and I were in, I can't remember, MI5 or MI6. Um, and my father got up, walked out of the room, slammed the door. In other words, we, we signed the Official Secrets Act. We do not talk about that. Oh, I see. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> so anyway, that was my dad. He was, yeah. he was, he was an agnostic. Um, uh, I discovered actually, one thing I've discovered quite recently is his baptism certificate. Um, so they were all baptized oh. because they thought that that'd be a way to avoid oh, persecution. Um, but, uh, so he, but he was, um, you know, he wasn't in any way a churchgoer. My mother was not a churchgoer either. So I didn't have a kind of Christian upbringing. Yeah. And what path did they set you on vocationally? Did you have one of those, like, you may choose one of five? No. Oh. No, you may choose one of one. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very clear. You may choose one of one. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> you are to be a barrister. <laughs> oh, well done. Yeah. Um, and the barrister, do you get to wig level? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the wig. Um, Thank that's you. The I, that's, that was important that's the to me to know the, that. Thank the you. Wig in the room. And that, that's what my father was. Yeah. He was a he was a barrister in Germany, and then he became a barrister in England. Yeah. My mother was a barrister. They met to get they met on opposite sides of a case. And that's a fun, sexy story. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, because yeah, I remember what happens. You know, in, in it's, it's one of the things I love about law. You go to court, you fight each other in court, and then you go out to lunch together. <laughs> and um, so that's what happened. They Cute. were on opposite sides of the case, and then they had lunch. Yeah. She was she was actually a, a junior or pupil, um, and uh, he was he was yeah. leaving on the other side. Anyway, that's how they got married. Um, <laughs> so that. so my father was a barrister. My mother's a barrister. My sister's uh, actually now a very distinguished barrister. Wow. Um, and um, my son and daughter both yeah. qualified. As I think just somewhere there you'll see a picture of my, my daughter in her wig. Um, uh, so my grandfathers on both sides yeah. were were barristers. My uncle was a barrister. I mean, it was you just had to do it. There was no there was no choice. I mean, my father would would have been absolutely horrified if I I did practice as a barrister for yeah. a few years, but he would have been horrified if I did anything else. Yeah, I can't relate to you at all. Uh, I'm a historian. My dad's a historian. Okay. My son wants to be a historian. Okay. So, um, well, you know that, yeah. <laughs> what about your mum? Was she story? Yeah, she, she was a singer. <laughs> but she loved oh, That's why you sing songs. so well. Yeah, that's I, not, yeah. No. <laughs> well, the only times I've actually been to Europe is when she was doing singing tours. And oh, I've wow. seen that woman stalked by a peacock <laughs> in an outdoor garden. Oh, so you grew I, up singing. I did. Yeah, you've got an amazing voice. Did you, <laughs> there you have. I heard it at the beginning. <laughs> I now need to emotionally turn the tables by insisting that you wear the wig for the rest of the, <laughs> the interview. Some people have befores and afters in their lives that are, you know, related to diagnoses or difficult moments or, but sometimes we have spiritual befores and afters where we just can't, we just can't go back. It sounds like you had one of those in that season. Yes. Uh, at 18, I had a, I had, I, I mean, I, I was at um, Cambridge University studying, actually I was studying economics at the time, I switched to the law then afterwards, but um, I was very happy. I mean, I was having a great time. You know, Cambridge University is a fun place to be. <laughs> and um, I was actually commuting to London on the, I was in the sort of party scene. I was yeah. just having, having, having a great life. And I certainly didn't feel there was anything missing. But I think looking back, there was a void. Um, I would say now it was a spiritual hunger. I would never have said I've got a spiritual hunger. I was very alienated by church. I've had some experience of church. It was always like the worst, most boring experience that you could ever imagine. I found Christians weird. There was, you know, weird smiles and all that kind of thing. <laughs> I, I found very uh, off-putting. Yeah. Um, but my closest friends, Nikki and Silla Lee, came back from um, an event they'd been at uh, 11 o'clock at night and they told me they had become Christians and literally I was horrified. I mean, they were, they were the most lovely people you could imagine. How could they, how could they have done it? And what's going to happen to them now? And so, so I thought, I've got to help them. And I thought, what can I read? And I, I, the only thing I could find was an old 
Bible that I'd had for, for RE at school. And I thought, well, I better read. Sorry, religious re education. Re religious education, yeah. yeah. So I thought, I better, better read this. Yeah. So I started at the New Testament. I started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke. Halfway through John, three o'clock in the morning, I fell asleep. And I just kept reading. Yeah. And now I look back and think, it was like the person I was reading about emerged. Mm. And... I encountered Jesus. It was like, it was an extraordinary moment. But my first thought was, this is true, but I can't face a miserable life. You know, this, if I followed you, this is like, like all that stuff that I've experienced, that, that I associate with religion. Yeah. And I thought, well, what I could do is really have a great life. And then on my deathbed, I'll become a Christian because it's true. And I thought, there's no integrity. I've just got to have a miserable life. So... So I just said, so I basically said, okay. I was like, literally, that was it. I said, okay, I'll, I'll say yes. Um, <laughs> to this horrible life with you, Lord. Life. Yeah, to this horrible life. This I like that, that This so miserable much. life I'm going to have. Oh, my gosh. No fun, everything, that dreary sort of... Uh, totally. It's true, but I, so it's like, oh, it's true. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that reminds me of something my dad said early on, because I was one of those kids who had been a Christian through her adolescence and my both my parents had become Christians later in life and okay my dad was like if anyone tries to tell you that being a Christian is a lot of fun they're lying to you <laughs> the other stuff is great too and I was like thanks dad that was that's your dad like, yeah thanks so what dad happened, that's a good so word. how did what happened to them my mom is the only person I've ever known who converted because of a tract Someone <laughs> handed her a three-fold piece of paper and she was going through a student center that was like, sinners in the eyes of God? <laughs> Me? <laughs> well, I suppose. <laughs> and like, and that was no. it. Yeah. It was very sudden. So a hundred million tracks <laughs> and one, and one, and one very successful Karen, Karen Jensen Bowler uh, and in, then, in and, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Yeah. And your dad was... This... My dad read, my dad was a bit wild and then he read Augustine and he was like, well, I guess that's wow, probably Wow, he read right. Augustine. Well, that's probably... Because he was a historian. He wanted, yeah. he wanted the history. He thought that makes sense as a worldview. And similarly, this probably won't be a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you, he, he may or may not share <laughs> to this day. <laughs> Has he not I mean, enjoyed it very much? Some sermons really are not our best, are they? No. There are, there are, but on the other hand, <laughs> I, I would say that instantly I found it was the opposite to what I thought. Oh, it was like instantly oh. I found that Jesus was like, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it yeah. in all its fullness. And yeah. it was like the void that I wasn't conscious of having was mm. filled and the spiritual hunger that I wasn't aware that I had was gone. And yeah. it was like, this is amazing. <laughs> I, everybody, you know, I'm, I'm, I was an atheist yesterday. So if I tell all my atheist friends it's true, they'll all believe. Here we go. <laughs> and then you Knock on the door. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hey, George. <laughs> I was wrong. It's true. That's amazing. So I thought George would be. Like, oh, I'm sure it was very well received. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I like how I was wrong too. Thank you for telling me. Because we all believed you when you argued the other case. So well, now, of course, we're going to believe you. When you started developing, because I know your church had this um, desire to create. I had work, been working on a curriculum, like a, like a thinking through different big questions yes. that we all have about how to live and that sounds like that became a very early passion project for you yeah i was well when i first inherited alpha as it was called as it is called um it was a course for people already christians and that's oh uh, so i i didn't want to take it on really because i thought yeah. i'm more interested in you know, i just thought Week one, isn't it great? <laughs> Week two, still pretty good. Yeah, I was, I was just more interested in, you know, I, I'd always had this passion to, um, from that moment really, to, to tell people. I just thought, you know, the most loving thing that I can do with my life mm. is to tell other people, because this is so good. Why wouldn't anyone not want to, want to experience it? So that was like what I wanted to do. So taking on a course for people who are already Christians, why, you know, if they're already Christians, then why bother? <laughs> it's like they're there already. <laughs> Uh, but on the very first course I ran, this guy turned up, a young guy called, called Matthew, who's about 25 years old, um, brought by a friend, Eric, who was on the course, said, I'm bringing my friend who's not a Christian, not interested in church, 
but he's heard there's some very attractive young women on this course and he's come to have a look <laughs> around during the talk. He's going to have a look around during the, during the talk and then he's going to leave before the small groups. So during the coffee break, I introduced him to one of the women on the course and he changed his mind and said he would stay. And he stayed for the whole course. He, he encountered Jesus, his life was changed. And then he married Pippa's, my wife Pippa's younger sister. So, so he's now my brother-in-law. So Matthew, that was the first one. That was October 1990. And then on the next course, he brought his sister and he brought, and he brought lots of people to the carol service. And I had a whole group of people outside the church and all of them, we had a 25 year reunion of that group. Oh. All of them last, you know, spent 25, have, have um, had a huge impact. And so that was when we realized, yeah. okay, we could adapt this course yeah. and make it a course for people outside the church. So we had to change it. You know, the, yeah. the small groups were Bible studies and people outside the church don't want a Bible study. Yeah. So we, we turned them into a discussion group. And then the, the discussions became amazing. Yeah. You know, it's just, so I'm, then it's like people come for a meal, so there's, that's community, they hear a talk, but questions hopefully that are relevant to their lives, and then you go into a discussion group. Yeah. And what it really is, those groups are amazing. Yeah. Because it's a, I suppose it's a, it's a sort of, a bit like AA or NA, the people are very open, they're very vulnerable, um, but it's a place where people can discuss yeah. what's really going on in their lives, and everyone has so much going on in their lives. And the, the host, you know, the way we train our hosts is there's a verse in Proverbs which says, in the heart of every human being is a deep well and the wise person draws it out. Mm -hmm. So the task of the host is to draw out from the deep well. I mean, you know that because you do brilliant interviews. You're, you are drawing out from the deep well that is in every human heart. And that so and it's a and it's, it's this fascinating discussion. So, for example, week three, uh, which we've just had in the course that I, that, well, Pippa and I are now on our hundredth small group in a row, um, and we love them all. But, but so week three, the question that, that the host would ask is, um, has anybody here ever needed to forgive someone? Mm. And you don't have to be a Christian to answer that question. But then people start to talk, you know from, you know, oh, I just had a row with my mum, I'm, I'm going to have to forgive her after yeah. this, to I've come out of an abusive marriage and I'm finding it really hard to forgive my ex-husband. And then the connection through that vulnerability. And then yeah. the next question, if you have time for it, is has anybody here ever needed to ask for forgiveness? Yeah. And then, you know, the, guy, the successful guy says, yeah, I, you know, I was an alcoholic and I did some terrible things. Yeah. Um, and I've had to, yeah, I've had a lot of people I need to ask for forgiveness from. And the, suddenly this guy who everyone looked at as so successful has shown his vulnerabilities. And as you know, we try and impress people with our strengths, but we actually connect through vulnerability. Yeah. And so you get this unbelievable closeness in the group. And you discover, but all of them had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Not one of them in that group was not dealing with a mental health issue. Mm. And you just think, we look around the first night, yeah. And it looked amazing. Yeah. We had no idea they were yeah. addicts and um, having mental health issues through through relationships they were going through. But this yeah. this this um, when we start to open up and be honest, yeah. you get this incredible connection. It's so powerful to hear because um, I mean the way that we're organized, like socially organized now, it's we have like this, we all are professional televangelists on social media. We have a, yes, a, yeah, yeah. a, a, a beautiful curated version of our lives. Yes. And then we have the couple people that we call who kind of know our stories and yeah. we might have the stuff that we don't want to change kind of on lock already yeah. and are not likely to be challenged. And then we might, if we are in distress, ask a therapist or reach out to somebody, but it can be very atomized and yeah. st structured in the way that we manage just our everyday vulnerability yeah and their description of curating kinds of interdependence around really meaningful questions yes is really beautiful yes and very yeah. like careful yeah i mean i think it's the, it, it's the it's the sort of balance between the community of eating together that there is some input. Yeah. We're not just sitting down, sitting around in a circle. Oh, my parents did a version where it was um, 
pasta, pond scum, and prayer. They, it was like <laughs> pasta because it was cheap and they could make yes. it. Pond scum, I think, was their like punch <laughs> recipe. Yeah. And then they were like, look, we're going to have something spiritual. I don't want to. The truth, <laughs> truth in advertising. But that was one of the only ways they could manage hospitality. Yes. And then they could have, you know, students or friends over. Yeah. And they ran, I think, six different alpha wow. clubs. Wow. With very different communities yeah. near the university. And they found that each group had different kinds of yeah. worries, but everyone kind of had yeah. their own personality of what they wanted to work through. That's what I find amazing, that it's running in the prisons. And in the prisons, people are so open right away. You know, that it's, it's sort of going into the prisons. Now, I, one of the reasons I love doing what I'm doing is because when I was a barrister, I was going to the prisons and you know, trying to help people get off their criminal offences. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, that is not a solution, yeah. actually. But it's not a long-term solution yeah. anyway. Um, and now to be able to go in there and see the way that they... Uh, and it, it made me realise, going to the prisons now, why Jesus loved to spend his time with tax collectors and sinners. Mm. Because the, Pharise the, the upright people were like, oh, no, we don't really need you. But in uh, the tax collectors and sinners was, Lord, oh, Jesus, help me. Yeah. Um, and in the prisons, it's very much like that. It's like, oh, Jesus, help me. Yeah. I need help. You know, I recognise I need help. Um, and, but yet it can run also in Parliament or yeah. in, in universities or whatever. And because it's the same. The needs are the same. Everyone's yeah. searching for love. Everyone's searching for purpose. Everyone's searching to belong. Yeah. And so the needs are the same in Korea, uh, Africa, yeah. Latin America, um, yeah. uh, Asia. It's the same all over the world. And the message is the same. Yeah. I have a question about... Um, cause I I think right now one of the main concerns, if they ever want to like wade into spiritual questions, is that everything very quickly feels like it's going to fall off the rails into culture wars or really, really tender topics. And then sometimes they never even really get to have some of their sort of bread and butter kind of issues dealt with. Yeah. I think one of the things that struck me, because I had read the... Uh, I. I read the alpha curriculum like 30 years ago when I was huh, but a child yeah. and then now as an adult and I think it is really I think it might be an it is a nice time to let people have like what is the what do I think about my my place in the in the meaning of life yeah. what would it mean for me to live a life of purpose what yeah. do I think about do I think the supernatural breaks in or not so much yeah. or some of these it might it just sounds like it's a maybe a reassuring time to feel like they're allowed mm. to talk about the basics yeah. because no one feels like there's ever basics anymore. I guess that's yeah. my I worry. think they can talk about anything. I mean, I think that's the idea is that nothing, there's nothing off the table. We're right. not trying to control, uh, you know, the conversation. Yeah. The conversation can be any way that the, the guests want to talk to each other. Yeah. Not The conversation not around the host. Yeah. It's the guests connecting with each other, yeah. talking amongst themselves about very, the kind of issues that's quite hard to talk about anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, where else do you get to talk about forgiveness yeah. as a subject? Where else do you get to talk about the, the meaning of life? Yeah. Um, and it's a place where you experience love. I mean, you experience it, first of all, coming in because of the hospitality, but supremely you experience it because uh, St. Paul wrote, the Son of God loved me yeah. and gave himself for me. And it's the, the, the message at the heart of, of Christianity, as you know, is love. Yeah. It's that God so loved the world and that, that for people to know that they're loved yeah. is so important. And, and then to experience love. And that's the role of the Holy Spirit. That's why we have a weekend or a day on the Holy Spirit, because the love of God, God's love for us is poured into our hearts yeah. by the Holy Spirit, Paul writes in Romans 5 verse 5. And that, that experience is the life-changing moment. So, I, I mean, I've read over the years thousands of questionnaires, and th it, this is, were you a Christian when you started the course? No. How would you describe yourself now, a Christian? When and how did the change occur? On the Alpha weekend, when I experienced the Holy Spirit, mm. the love of God. It's basically the, the experience, and people are looking for experience. I mean, some people, it's all about head knowledge, they want truth, but that, you know, that's, that's who is Jesus, we go through the evidence. Yeah. But there's also a deep hunger f for more than that, for, for yeah. experience. And you get both. You get, you get uh, the truth, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, yeah. but, but also 
we experience his love through the Holy Spirit. And yeah. that's the life-changing moment. Yeah. I had a really weird church growing up, and I hesitate to be as specific as I will be right now. Right, go on, go on. <laughs> they, they were so weird. But it was a church of people who didn't really belong in other churches and kind of just ended up there. We were this sort of like grab bag of... <laughs> So you have people who have been uh, Mormons and still really liked Mormonism, but just kind of weren't really that into it anymore. And we're going to this church, and um, and and one of the older ladies made my like graduation prom dress because I, our family couldn't afford like nice nice yeah. things, and yeah. they were so attentive to all of the particularities of Are you okay? How's your mom? What's going on with your and, but I think it was mostly the fact that they didn't, there was, they didn't agree on very much. Like now when I ask them, did you really agree with so-and-so <laughs> about, you know, this view of salvation or that bit about the, and they had a real sense that like they were united by a, a core set of, of beliefs, mm. but like the rest of it was really a mishmash. When I look back on what an ideal church looks like to me, I think about them all the time because hmm. they tolerated each other. Yes. Over like 50 years, they tolerated <laughs> like yeah. disagreement yes. with yes. this like shared yeah. love. Yes. And they were so concrete in their love. Oh. And I just, I mean, my pastor was the first, he, he had a difficult divorce and, oh. uh, and they had so much grace. Oh. And he, I think he was the only divorced pastor in the, mm. you know, a hundred miles. And yeah. And there was so much love and like shrugging at just the right time. Yeah. And every time I felt like it kept getting reborn into different kinds of forgiveness for each yeah. other. We had some difficult deaths, some difficult arguments, yeah. but it's still my favorite version of yes. what if we just kept yeah, doing this? It's beautiful. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, you know, we want the church to be perfect, but it's actually because I'm a member of it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's become imperfect and it's... Um, <laughs> Um, we, we're, you know, I'm, I'm a, a broken, flawed human being, and um, and we are. That's what we are. We're a, we're a group of broken people, and it's more like a hospital than a museum. And it's it's yes. um, it's a place where you can find community and healing, and other people who are also struggling with the same issues that you're struggling with. And um, at the heart is what unites us um, is so much greater than what divides us. Yeah. And if we focus on the things that unite us, yeah. uh, then, and getting that message out and serving the community. You know, the, it, it, churches are in trouble when they become inward looking. It's like, like everything, nations mm -hmm. become in trouble. They don't become great by looking inwards, they become great by looking outwards. Yeah. People become great, not by looking inwards, but by looking outwards. We don't like people who, who are sort of egotistical and yeah. um, focused on themselves. We yeah. love people who are like you are. You're like focused outwards. Yeah. Um, and um, it's the same with true with church. Church is not meant to be focused inwards. It's meant to be focused outwards on the yeah. needs of the people around. Yeah. The hungry, the homeless, the poor, um, and the people, the lost. You know, it's, 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 and that's, that's what makes a church great. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And the way to do that is not by focusing on the things that you disagree about. Yeah. You know, we have conferences that are made up of Catholics, Baptists, Pentecostals, Orthodox, Salvation Army. We could, at the conference, say, OK, people on that side, people who believe in infant baptism, people on this side, people who, who think only adult baptism. Yeah. And then we really want unity at this conference. <laughs> Let's try and get a compromise position on somewhere between infant and adult baptism. Let's see, if we, see if we can all see if we can all agree an age. Yes, yes. <laughs> where, where, uh, and you can change your beliefs, and you can, and we'll find this place in the middle that will will um, you know what a waste of time. <laughs> you know the fact is we agree about so many things. The fact that we disagree about yeah. you know the time of your baptism. Honestly, does that matter? Yeah. Um, uh, so, but if you if you focus on the things that you disagree about, you get yeah. disunity. Yeah. If you focus about what you, uh, if you focus on outside, looking outwards, then you have to be united because yeah. no one's going to be interested if you're fighting each other. Yes, that's right. A friend of mine said to me, "He's not a Christian." He said, "You Catholics, you Protestants, 
you look exactly the same to me. You've both got these church buildings. You both, you both do something with bread and wine. Um, you both say these prayers. You do the Lord's Prayer. He said, you look exactly the same to me. Yeah. He said, whatever it is you disagree about, and I have no idea what it is, but it's got nothing to do with my life. But while you're fighting each other, yeah. I'm not interested. Yeah. And I think that's, that's you know, why, why are we fighting with each other about things that are totally irrelevant to the people out there? Mm -hmm. They don't care whether it's that we believe in infant baptism or adult baptism or whatever. Mm -hmm. that they have needs. They're, 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 they've got struggles in their lives and they're desperately needy. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a message of hope for the world. That's, let's get out and get the message out. And there are people there, and there's so many, it, I, I still believe the greatest need is, is, is to know about Jesus, but there are a whole lot of other very big needs. There's, there's hunger, there's homelessness, there's war, there's, there are refugees, there are people in prison. You know, there's so much else to get on with. Let's get on with that. I think, too, you and I have a very high tolerance. And I mean, like, um, tolerance is the wrong word, but... Uh, I imagine when we both meet someone who's very, very different from us theologically or spiritually, we both get a little excited. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> what can I learn? And what have I not what? seen? <laughs> uh, yeah, and what have I not seen that yeah. you've seen? Yeah. Because you've seen something uh, that I probably missed it. Tell me. Yeah, I think in university, I was trained to be a historian, but you get to pick a subspecialty. And then I immediately went to cultural anthropology because they're professional oh, wow. observers. They're okay. wonderful at figuring out how to be in very different cultures and be, you know, not just like all the regular ethical practices, but like how do you learn to intellectually and emotionally immerse yourself in, um, and I just have found that that training has probably helped me more than anything huh. else to stay very open when I'm yes. around something I don't understand Yes. and then stay put along, like long enough to have a, at least a couple good questions. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, I think that's what we, we've learned. I just, you know, I, I, I never thought Alpha would go beyond our own local church. Um, and then I certainly never thought it would go beyond the Church of England. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, Baptists got interested, Catholics got interested, they asked us to go and do conferences. And yeah. we'd go and go, oh my goodness, there's so much to learn yeah. from the Salvation Army. Yeah. You know, there's so much to learn from the Catholic Church, so much riches in the Orthodox Church, uh, so much, yeah. you know, Pentecostals. You know, what, I, I love doing, you know, Me conversation too. for Pentecostal. You, you learn so much. They've got the great faith and they're, they just, uh, but they're so different. And yeah. yet they're all part of this diversity, this rich diversity yeah. of the body of Christ. So you are... Uh, your type, she said, uh, magisterially, never retires. <laughs> there is retirement. There's just different seasons. Do you uh, have any advice for people who are trying to think about what calling feels like as they think about... Often we have our life, we always think about in halves, but maybe really it's in thirds, right? Mm. There's that first vocational, who am I going to be? How do I get all mm. the means to even just try and then the middle one just doing it grinding it out there's a lot of climbing climbing trying trying but yeah. then there's a third at the end where there's different kinds of roles people are doing a lot of caregiving in different yes. ways or maybe there's a chance to think about a different way of service i wonder yes. what kind of advice you might give to people who are thinking about a different turn yeah, I think, I mean, it's so interesting. I mean, I, I, mean, I think about this more now <laughs> as, I, as I enter that. It's very interesting the, the way the demographics have changed in the world. So when the pension came out in the UK, you got a pension when you were 70, and life expectancy was 52. Uh -huh. Now uh -huh. you get a pension at 66, and if you get there, life expectancy is 85. So you've got a 20-year yeah. period, um, which we didn't think about before because you retired and died. Yeah. If, you, if you were lucky, you got to retire. <laughs> Usually you died before that. But um, now you've got this, this period, post-60, really. Um, so the Guardian newspaper run an article every week on life, kind of life begins at 60. Yeah. Um, 
Um, and so it's all these people who, I was a teacher, I love teaching, but what I really like is magic. Or the one this week was, oh, what I really love is woodwork. So, you know, age 60, I'm going to be a carpenter. Um, age, so I think this is a massive opportunity. It's a massive opportunity for the Church of England, for example. Yeah. So we started our theological college, which we started with together with the Bishop of London, a stream called the Caleb stream. Because mm -hmm. Caleb, as you all know, was still going strong at 85. So uh, what about people who have loved ministry all their life, yeah. but they've been... Uh, you know, they've been a, a banker or a lorry driver or they've been, a, um, they've been uh, a, a, in the medical profession or in the army. Yeah. You know, in the army you come out at like 55 or even younger. Um, so you've got 30 years ahead of you. Yeah. So what an opportunity. If you, what you really love is ministry, not, of course, some people, that it'd be something totally different. But in the UK, there are 500,000 Anglicans who are in the age group 58 to 72. There are 12 million people in that age group, sorry, 10 million people in that age group, of whom 500,000 are church-going Anglicans. How many of those would love to do ministry for the rest of their lives? So there's 6,000 churches in the UK, Church of England churches that need yeah. a focal minister. Uh -huh. Look, you could have the, all of these people. Oh. Um, anyway, that's the vision. There really aren't pastors for those churches. No. Well, they have. You have like eight. You have one pastor for eighteen yes. churches. Yeah. And yeah. and what the what the research shows, if you have a focal minister, the church tends to grow. Yeah. If you have no one, it declines slower than if you have one person Stop. for eighteen people. Well, if you have no one, then everyone says, "Oh, we got to do yeah, it ourselves." Yeah, yeah. But if you have one person, they think, oh, we're all we'll just dependent. wait. We'll just wait. Yeah. But we have to wait a long time because he's only coming once a month. <laughs> I do love that. Because there's that, I do love the idea of like giving people a sense of that there's, that their story has a lot of chapters. And yes. They can be really surprised. Yeah. Like joyfully, spiritually surprised by yeah. what a new season yeah. might well, bring. People say your most productive decade is 60 to 70. Wow. And your second most productive is 70 to 80. What? <laughs> I don't know what the rest I just got to get there. <laughs> I just got to get there. <laughs> well, I don't think it applies to everything. I don't think it applies to sprinting, for example. Yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, I think that's lovely, especially because, I mean... I think as we start to try to define ourselves by not the resume virtues, yeah. but by these Eulogy deep questions yeah. of purpose, yes. then what a nice time to say, well, I didn't get a chance to yeah. sprint in this area, yeah. and now's my, now's my time. Yeah. Who could I be if I... Yes. Especially with service. I, I think one of the things we worry about a lot, especially since so many people in our listening community have people that they care for that they're or they have very emotionally expensive professions yes that it is that because we don't talk a lot culturally about service and the people who did are now growing old yes that we really do need an opportunity to think about how we can learn from that and work it into our i mean everybody's busy but that's not what i mean yeah you know? but yeah. how do we know exactly how to plug into service in communities in a way that can carry, you know, help carry the load a little bit. Yeah. Well, it helps carry the load, but also gives people purpose. Yeah. In, you know, you can play golf. Oh, at least I can, but... but um, people, but pe people can play people golf. People can play golf <laughs> and do it four days a week or whatever. But yeah. is that really yeah. uh, what you want to do for the yeah. rest of your life? Yeah. Or is there something that you can do that makes a real difference to the people around you? Nikki, you are kind and you are so funny. And I am so grateful for your insanely deep love of God. <laughs> it's a beautiful oh, thing to be around. Oh, and no, it's amazing to be with you, Kate. You've got a wonderful smile really? and a wonderful joy. <laughs>